Hello, 10th grade. Yesterday we talked about the inventions and the technology from the Industrial Revolution. Today we have a lot to get through, so I'm going to jump right in. We're going to talk about, okay, yesterday we did the tech side, now we're going to do the human side. What were the social effects of the Industrial Revolution? So, pause this video if you need, get out something to take notes with, paper's fine for this one. And here's the three different areas we're going to be looking at. First, urbanization. Just lots of folks move to cities. What did that do to daily life? Next up, families. The family unit changed. How many kids you had changed. When you got married, who you married changed. Uh, how did all that work? And I labeled this eventually good stuff. The social effects, a lot of them were negative at first, but ultimately they led up to something better than we had before. So here's our three main social effect areas we're going to be looking at today. Urbanization. If you look at this picture, which I can't remember if it's Manchester or Liverpool, but one of the early industrial cities. Uh, you can see a couple things. You can see that there's so much smoke, you can't see the sky. Uh, a lot of the buildings, they don't just look dark. The smoke actually stained the cities black. Um, there's pollution. The streets are narrow. Um, living in a city at this time was, was not pleasant. Everyone moved there very, very fast because it was this crazy brand new thing. These factories have all these jobs, all this money, um, and lots of people move very close together very quickly. But the way that worked, no one actually had a plan for how to make it function. So we didn't have things like a sewage system, garbage pickup, um, street signals, traffic lights. So a lot of people were suddenly in a very tight space and it was kind of a mess. So we had overpopulation, which always leads to um, increased disease and pollution. The other downside of this was having a surplus of workers meant that each individual worker tended to have fewer rights and lower pay. So huge number of people, it's going to be easier to take advantage of everyone at the bottom of the pyramid. As always, pause if you need to, but that's the bad side, really, of the growth of cities at this time. Next, we're going to talk about how family life changed. And this one, just like families, gets a little bit messy and complicated. Uh, bear with me, because a lot of things affected a lot of other things. But family life and how families looked and how they worked changed a whole lot during this period. If you think of in the 14, 15, 1600s, um, a regular family unit was pretty large. Divorce was incredibly rare. Um, people got married very young. And some of those things started to change. The first cause of that was women could work in factories, and that gave them, for the first time, an option of how to live their life outside of getting married. Because before women were allowed to have jobs in factories, their only way to support themselves was having a husband. So women can earn their own wages. That is one of the catalysts for all this change. If women can earn their own wages, on average, they will usually wait longer to get married. So women are waiting up into their 20s to get married instead of having to do it as teenagers. Because of that, uh, families are naturally going to become smaller because the people getting married are older. Um, so the potential parents being older means fewer years to have children. And there's two other reasons we're going to look at for how families became smaller 
during this time. So first of all, women were er earning their own wages, and that meant they didn't have to get married so young, fewer years to bear children. But also families got smaller because we didn't need as much help on a farm. Um, having extra free labor around the house was no longer as valuable because you didn't work in the home like you do on a farm. You weren't taking care of your own property. You were going somewhere else. So children were essentially just another mouth to feed. Um, so parents didn't need the free labor as much, essentially. And that led to families becoming smaller. And then the last reason families got smaller at this time is life expectancy also started going up. I know I just said that disease and pollution harmed a lot of people during this time period, and that's true. But in the long term, some parts of the Industrial Revolution, like uh, better medicine, better food, better access to both those things, improved life expectancy, which meant actually families got smaller because you didn't have to have so many children just to have one of them live to adulthood. The reason life expectancies are considered so short, um, say back in the medieval era, is not actually because people didn't live very long, but it's because most babies that you had would die as babies. So when you no longer have all your babies dying, um, family units are going to become smaller and people have fewer children. So here is a very quick overview of, on average, this wasn't true for everyone, but on average, how did families change because of industrialization? Um, they got smaller, families started later, um, and fewer farmhands were needed. So um, we kind of first started having the idea of what a child is and what childhood is start to change a little bit. Okay, we've talked about two depressing things. Um, urbanization and how much cities kind of sucked. Um, how families changed and all that. But we also have four really good positive effects of the Industrial Revolution socially. How did it help people? First one, we already mentioned women can get paid. Having money means having political power. Uh, and women having more of this power is going to lead to them being able to vote. Please don't forget, suffrage means the right to vote. So the fact that women can now make their own wages, this gives them political power. This leads to uh, them having the right to vote. It was also mostly women in the Western world, at least, who led abolition movements to get rid of slavery. So by getting the vote, uh, that helped lead to getting rid of slavery, which is also good. Another good thing socially is all that agricultural technology helped increase the food supply. So we had more nutrition and better nutrition for more people because of all those agricultural inventions and the transportation inventions we had to move that food around. These next two are more long-term. Eventually, collective bargaining and protests are gonna lead to people having more rights, both citizens' rights uh, and workers' rights. That takes a while to catch up. Early on, people have fewer rights than they had ever had, but later on, it gets better than it was even before. And last, eventually, having a higher literacy rate and people more concentrated closer together is going to lead to improvements in education, medicine, science, all that kind of good human learning stuff is going to improve because we just have more people closer together um, reading and talking and coming up with ideas. So still lots of positives are coming out of this, not just on the invention scene, but also on the social side of things.
pause that if you need to, but four big good effects. Voting power, more food, more rights eventually, but we had to fight for these, and more uh, improvements in education and medicine and science. But again, that one's long term. That's the lecture for today. We have two more things. First one is short. I am only going to take about five minutes on this, but I want you at your table groups or in partners, whatever works, to read these three pages in the textbook, 723 through 725. It's pretty short and it just describes what life was like in an industrializing city at this time what were living conditions, working conditions, how many hours a day did you have to work, what was it like to be in the different social classes. So we're going to take five minutes, pause this video, read that, and summarize it together. All right, hello again. Fabulous job, I'm sure. Um, so we've done our lecture, we've done just a smidge of book reading, and here is the fun creative part of today. Your actual assignment in helping us understand the social changes of the Industrial Revolution is to create your own character, your own story from the point of view of someone during the Industrial Revolution. Um, so we're making up a story about someone who lived at this time. And that can be anyone you can think of. That can be a regular worker. That can be a labor union leader, an inventor, a factory owner, a politician, a slave who is being freed as industry makes slavery obsolete. Many, many options. Your job is to make a story from the point of view of someone who is living it. And that is probably going to change how that person's family looks, their work, their living conditions, their life decisions. I want you to try to show all of those. And we're going to look, as always, quickly at my power school to find that assignment. You go to the weekly schedule, video lecture below, and story assignment. If you click on story assignment, that will take you to a page that looks like this. You need to create a story. You can do this with any medium you want, as long as you can turn it in online. So text, PowerPoint, photo story, comic strip. If you want to do something and then take photos of it and upload those, that will work. But find some way to make up a character that lived in the Industrial Revolution and show how their life changed because of the Industrial Revolution. What was life like then? Show me that in a story and that's all we need. Um, a couple of suggestions here. You could use multiple characters to show multiple points of view. Maybe some people love the city and some people hate it, for example some other details to help you get started. Uh, where was your character born? The country or the city? Uh, what does your character worry about? What do they dream about? What do they think of all these new inventions? Um, and those are just some places to get started. I'm not grading on grammar and spelling as long as I can tell what you're trying to say. Uh, and if you want full points, let's go above and beyond the bare minimum of details, folks. Um, there's lots of ways you can do that. Just throw me in some actual details. Um, let's see. So, for the rest of this period, we're creating a story in some way or another. Um, by Sunday night, we should have turned this into Dropbox. Enjoy your long weekends, and I will see you again on Monday. Thanks, folks.